joining us today. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm uh, I'm excited to uh, to be here and to get to talk about the stock market a little bit with you guys. Um, I uh, when I was uh, telling one of my friends about about this, uh, he said uh, you're going to talk about the basic stock market stuff to uh, people getting PhDs. They're going to laugh at you. I think it's too basic, but. Uh, um, so I, I uh, but that was kind of the mission was to do sort of a really quick overview of some conceptual stuff. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to say that like, this is my area, you know, where I've focused, but there are certainly, there are no dumb questions at all. And so many people that I encounter, you know, just kind of every day have so little idea of kind of what the basic tenets of the market are. So I thought it might be useful to go over some of those. And uh, I left a lot of time for questions if anybody wants to dig into anything Specifically, uh, the presentation should only take 20 or so minutes. So uh, I apologize if it's uh, too basic. I apologize if it's too advanced, uh, but uh, hopefully we'll, uh, it'll, it'll be of use to people. So anyways, I called it basic stock market concepts. Uh, I assume everybody can see the screen. Um, yes, we can. Uh, oh, good. Uh, so this is my biography. Uh, Sokol touched on a little bit. I grew up in Farmington Hills. Uh, I was in the undergraduate business school at Michigan. I graduated in 2000. Uh, I immediately ran off uh, to start working 20-hour uh, days at Goldman Sachs, which is an investment bank in New York. Uh, by the way, investment banking is one of those concepts that I, I, uh, I feel like nobody actually understands either. Uh, so if anybody wants to talk about that some uh, in the Q&A portion, I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, I lasted about uh, 18 months there uh, uh, before I jumped ship and went to two family-oriented investment partnerships, um, Corston and MSD, where I was essentially helping to manage money for uh, some very, very wealthy and very philanthropic families. Uh, MSD stands for Michael, those are Michael Dell's initials of uh, Dell Computer. Um, and then my partner and I, uh, uh, we left MSD and we started our firm, which was called Brenner West. Uh, it was uh, my partner and my middle names. We, we weren't uh, any more creative beyond that to come up with the name of our fund, but uh, we were a hedge fund that we started in 05. We wound it down in 2019. Uh, we built a track record that we were really proud of. We generated about uh, gross of fees, about 14, 15% a year over 14 years in a seven or 8% market, which was pretty good. Uh, we had peak assets of around a billion and a half. And uh, our strategy, which if anybody's interested, we can I can circle back to later, but basically we just, we bought uh, stocks and distressed securities and we put on sorts and opportunistic hedges where we felt uh, were necessary and we never used any leverage. So it was basically just uh, trying to trying to make good decisions. And we ran what's what's sort of known as a concentrated fund where we only had a handful of investments at any one time. So we weren't very diversified. Um, so getting into uh, some of the substance, this is my uh, my famous, my favorite quote from Warren Buffett. If any of you guys don't know him, he's the, uh, he's the longtime chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, which is a conglomerate based in Nebraska. That's a public company. Uh, and he likes to say that uh, risk comes from not knowing what you're doing which uh, I think is pretty instructive and uh, probably extends uh, beyond investing as well. Um, getting into the actual stock market stuff. So I thought it would be apropos uh, to have the first thing uh, be the question of what is a stock? Uh, I, think, I think a lot of people don't actually know what that is. Um, you know, put simply, and, and I think this is a super important concept in investing, maybe the most important concept is that you know, a stock just isn't something that trades in somebody's account that has a price that goes up and down all day, but, you know, it really represents a share in a company. Um, you know, if we had a private company, any three of us, and we each had a share and it was worth $9, uh, you know, we'd be worth $3 each to all of us. And, you know, it, I think the idea really is that you own a share in an actual business, and that's the way to think about it. Um, the stock price doesn't tell you anything about how the business is valued. You, of course, need to know how many other shares are out there. Uh, sometimes people think, well, it's a $20 stock, it's expensive. It's a $5 stock, it's cheap. But, you know, th that doesn't mean anything. Uh, what, what matters is the stock price times the number of shares that are out there. Um, 
And that gets you to the market capitalization or the market cap. And the market cap is really what the market is saying the company is worth to the shareholders. Um, and that's a function really of dividends. That's, you know, at the end of the end of the day, uh, the main reason to own a stock, at least in theory, is for dividends. Dividends are the cash payments um, that a company would pay its shareholders. And uh, the value of a company is really just the value of its future dividends. So stock price, shares outstanding, market cap, and dividends. Um, when I looked at a company, these were kind of the four categories that I would think about. Um, I think this is pretty accessible, really, without a ton of technical knowledge. Um, I would say the first thing I probably looked at was the balance sheet. For those of you who've never had any accounting, which uh, I presume is the vast majority of, of people, um, a balance sheet is simply an accounting snapshot of a company. And very simplistically, the assets are the, the things that the company owns uh, that will produce cash flow or can be sold. And the other side is the liabilities, which are what a company owes. And so when I think about this category of the balance sheet, it's, um, you know, what does the company have? How much cash do they have? And what do they owe? Because if a company has too much debt, um, you know, that can be something of a non-starter in terms of even wanting to invest in it at all. Um, the second thing is business quality. Um, and this is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, you know, if, if we were, uh, if any of us were going to start a business together, you know, what would we want to know? We'd want to know is the, you know, is the, does the business produce cash flow? Do, is it predictable? Um, is it going to be around in 10 or 15 years? Uh, you know, what are the risks facing it? What are the competitive situation? You know, really it's all that stuff. And frankly, this was the part of investing, the part of the analysis that my partner and I spent the most time on is really just, you know, what is this company that we're investing in? Because we, we invested in, in lots of different industries. So we were always kind of asking this question anew. Um, of course, growth is a critical element. Um, is this company going to be, you know, the next Google, is it going to be 10 times the size it is now, you know, in, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, is it going to shrink, uh, you know, trying to predict within, you know, with some kind of margin of error, like how this cash flow stream is likely to evolve uh, is a key component. And then when I put that all together, uh, you know, the concept of valuation is sort of uh, how does this all fit together? Um, you know, how do you know, at the end of the day, you're trying to buy a stock if you're investing in a company, you're trying to buy it for less than what it's worth. Um, and so there's that question of how do you even begin to ask that about whatever you're looking at? And uh, this goes into uh, a very, very simple ratio, which is the most common way to think about this question of valuation, this question of, um, you know, what am I get, what am I getting, and what am I paying? Um, and a PE ratio is something. If you opened up Yahoo Finance, you know, Yahoo Finance would probably be the first thing that would be listed. If you opened up a Wall Street Research report, it might be the first thing you saw. And I'm going to attempt to define it here, uh, hopefully clearly. The uh, the P stands simply for the stock price. The E stands for earnings per share. So you want to divide the stock price by earnings per share to make sure you're accounting for how many shares there are. Earnings, for those of you who don't know, is, is really just a proxy for cash flow. At the end of the day, it's, it's how much cash flow um, you know, will the business generate in a year. And uh, I'm sure most of you will know that uh, you know, the P divided by the E hopefully is as low as possible. And the lower it is, the more you're getting the more earnings you're getting for every dollar that you're paying for your shares. And uh, ideally you'd wanna combine all these things together and get a very high growing, high quality set of earnings or cash flow stream at a low price. So a low PE, high quality, high growth. Um, I thought I would touch briefly on uh, growth investing versus value investing. Um, we were very much in the school of value investing. Um, and typically what's meant by that, all, the, all these terms are really defined differently by different practitioners, but um, value investing for the most part is when 
you're trying to buy something for less than you think it's worth based on current factors. So a very low PE, you know, a low ratio of market cap to free cash flow, um, you know, a high quality company, you're, you're, you're trying to get in on something, you know, for, for less than, than what the market might value it at later. Um, with growth, although that's true as well, you're, you're typically focused very exclusively on how much will revenues and ultimately cash flow grow. And you're sort of hoping that regardless of, of what the current factors are, uh, in the future, the company will grow so much that it will cause the valuation to increase, the market will pay more attention to it. Um, and uh, hopefully the stock price will go up as a result. And uh, this last bullet point was something that I think my partner and I kind of learned uh, over time, which is just that, you know, even though we were value investors, most of our best investments over time were also in companies that were growing. Um, and there's no real reason why you can't, uh, you know, look for things that are both high quality, trading at a good price and, uh, and growing. And, and the way we did that was to always look through lots and lots of companies uh, to try to find a very small number that met all these all the criteria that we were looking for. Um, okay, shorting stocks. Uh, so uh, I'll caveat this by saying that uh, uh, I think that uh, individuals uh, typically shouldn't short stocks. It, it can be kind of a dangerous thing and, and I'll get into why, but um, for those of you who don't know, shorting is essentially the opposite of buying a stock. When you buy a stock, you know, of course, you you buy it and you hope that the stock price will go up and then you can sell it for a profit. Um, shorting is really the exact opposite. And so you're 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 hoping that the stock will go down. And many people don't know the mechanics of how a short works, but um, what's required is you have to go to a broker that could be a Citigroup account, that could be an Ameritrade account, it could be um, however you you buy stocks and. The way you short is you have to borrow, you have to get the broker to lend you somebody else's shares. Um, say they, you wanted to short Microsoft, which I don't recommend. Um, but Microsoft is trading, I think around $285. So you would borrow those shares from the broker. You would go into the market and you would sell them, presumably through the same broker. If it was Microsoft, you would, uh, you would cash out your $285 and then you're left with an obligation to return those shares uh, at a certain point, um, or sometimes it's indefinite. Um, and the idea is that if, if you're doing it with Microsoft, you're saying, well, I think the stock is going to go down. Uh, you know, in two years, I'll be able to buy back the shares at, uh, you know, say 200. Um, I'll give the shares back to the broker. And then my profit would be $85, the 285 that I sold it for minus the 200 I had to spend buying it back. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully that will be a good trade. And this leads to the third point on this page, which is that uh, shorting in some ways is actually inherently an unfavorable proposition. Um, when you buy a stock, when you go long a stock, uh, the most you can lose, as I'm sure people know, is, is uh, 100%. And so well. Uh, Nobody ever wants to lose all their money in an investment, and I hope uh, nobody on the Zoom ever does. Um, shorting is actually even more risky because, uh, you know, if you go and you short Microsoft at 285 and it goes up 500%, you know, it goes up five times and you have something at, you know, 1400 or something, you're on the hook for that five times. So you can actually lose much more than 100% of your money. Um, so I don't recommend shorting, but... Uh, I thought it was maybe an interesting thing to go over, um, which leads us to uh, another thing I'm not sure I recommend, which is buying individual stocks at all. Uh, I have a I have a, a, a fact on here that I, I found on CNBC, but uh, there's lots of facts of this sort, which is that 85% uh, of mutual funds, a mutual fund is a group of stocks picked by a professional investor, presumably, um, that you that people can buy into, but 85% of mutual funds, so stocks that were picked by a professional, large cap stocks actually did worse than just buying uh, the S&P 500 in the 10 years ending 2019. Uh, the S&P 500, for those of you who may not know, represents uh, the 500 biggest companies, uh, typically multinational companies based in the US. Um, 
And you can actually buy an index fund for very low fees, which will allow you to own a, a market cap weighted uh, average of the S&P 500. And so you can just buy, you can just own your share in, in all the you know, biggest 500 companies. And uh, you would have done better than 85% of professional mutual fund managers. And uh, the S&P 500 also has other favorable parts to it as well. So it's, as I mentioned, it's very low fee, uh, which is always great. It's uh, very, very liquid. Uh, liquidity in investment terms is meant to describe how much trades each day. And the more liquid, the better, because that means uh, the more that trades, the easier it is to buy and sell, the less you're going to get stuck. Um, it's extremely diversified. It has 500 companies in it. Um, and so if uh, you know something terrible happens in Silicon Valley and Microsoft, Google, and Apple all go bankrupt, well, uh, that won't be great, but uh, you won't do too terribly uh, because it'll only be three out of the 500, um, although that doesn't sound like a fun scenario. And uh, in fairness, on the other side, uh, if those three companies go to the moon, then uh, you won't necessarily get rich. But uh, I think for most people, more diversification is, uh, is a good thing. And I wrote up here DJIA uh, as well. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that's the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Um, Whenever I uh, speak with my mom, who uh, uh, Sokol, Sokol knows, um, she's always talking about how the Dow did, and I have to remember what the Dow is because it's kind of a meaningless concept to me. Um, but the Dow is, uh, is an average of 30 companies selected by uh, the Dow Jones Company, which owns the Wall Street Journal, or used to own the Wall Street Journal. Um, it's just 30 industrial companies, which are sometimes also meant to represent an average of sort of how the market as a whole is doing. Um, but the takeaway from this slide is that it's very, very hard to beat the S&P. Um, and we can talk more about reasons why that is um, if people are interested. Okay, so uh, this also is, is uh, very explicitly not a recommendation, um, but I thought you know, it might be fun to just walk through something that I was looking at myself the other day in terms of a specific company to kind of put these concepts uh, in action. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Outback Steakhouse. Uh, so it's owned by a company called Blumen Brands Inc. Uh, the ticker, the letters you would punch into Yahoo Finance to see it are BLMN. Um, and you know this, this slide just kind of gives a snapshot of how I might think about or how one might think about uh, you know, a company and, and why it might be attractive. And actually my partner and I owned some other restaurants during our time at Brenner West. We were uh, once the biggest uh, shareholders in the franchisor Popeyes, um, if uh, if anybody's interested, now actually it was a it was a big winner for us uh, for reasons I can talk about if, again if anyone cares. But um, Bloom and Brands is a company with about 1,500 restaurants, two thirds of which are uh, Outbacks. They've got a bunch of other concepts uh, here as well. I think I ate at a Bonefish Grill one. Um, why it might be attractive? So the average S and P 500 company trades at uh, over 20 times earnings, so uh, pretty expensive. Uh, you're having to pay you know, 20 times the annual earnings that you're getting in a year. Uh, Outback Steakhouse, like many other restaurants, trades for a lot less than that, which it, it probably should trade for something less than that, but I think nine times earnings is, is really cheap. Um, the company, I think, has a good management team uh, from a few years back that actually managed to grow earnings 50%, so they've, they've done some good things there uh, pre-COVID. Um, and then the current situation is sort of interesting as well. And so uh, while COVID has obviously been horrible in you know the many ways that we all know in terms of all the terrible things that have gone on, it's it's, it's also been pretty bad for the restaurant sector, uh, you know, for reasons that are obvious. Um, and there are some estimates that 15 or 20 percent of restaurants actually closed during this time. Um, so. I think that actually that might be positive for Outback and for some of the bigger chains because you know they had the financial wherewithal to kind of stick around, um, and uh, you know they're going to have less competition as we move through this. Uh, they also were forced to come up with new business lines, uh, more takeout delivery, which I think they're learning how to do, and and I think customers are getting used to. Um, and then I think a lot of people believe, and 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 uh, I think there's. It's, it's a reasonable case that once COVID is really truly behind us, um, I think 
Outback is currently operating at about 85, 90% of 2019 capacity. But once COVID is hopefully really over, hopefully, you know, sometime next year, uh, there probably is going to be a pretty big boom in terms of people you know, getting out, going to restaurants, flying around, do all kind of, doing stuff that they love to do. And you sort of put all those together and uh, you've got a low earnings uh, multiple. You've got some growth. We've got a good competitive situation and the prospect for a couple of really good years with new business lines and less competition. Um, I, thought, I thought it sounded kind of interesting, um, but again, I'm not recommending it. <laughs> um, I have a pay, I have a item on here that says risks. Um, so uh, there are definitely some risks in this environment. It's very hard to hire people to work at restaurants right now for a lot of different reasons. Um, there's commodity inflation, which means they're having to pay more for the stuff that they buy. Uh, beef and chicken and other prices are up a lot. And then uh, my favorite item, the balance sheet, is uh, it's not the best balance sheet. That they have a fair amount of debt, and so some some factors to be very uh, wary of. Um, but uh, anyways, I thought that that was uh, one company to run through. Um, I, I thought very briefly I would touch on. Uh, options. So um, options are usually a different way to uh, to make a, a, a bet on a company other than just buying or shorting a stock. Usually it's for people who have a specific view of um, a stock. They think a stock price is going to do, is going to either go up or down within a certain time component and they want to have a lot of leverage to that. Um, and so for like a, for a call option, if you're betting that a stock will go up, um, if the stock's trading at 10, you can buy an option uh, to buy it at, to buy a lot of shares at, at 15, um, you know, within six months. And if that happens in the next six months, which is a, a speculative proposition, you'll, you'll make more money than you might just putting those dollars into, a, into the regular stock. Uh, same thing with a put option, which would typically be a, a, an option to sell the shares at a lower price, which would go up in value if the stock goes down. Um, Again, this is a very, I, I know a lot of uh, individual investors like to play with options. It's very speculative. There's a lot more implied leverage um, and it's very, very easy to lose all your money. Um, but I thought I would go over quickly. Uh, and then this was the last uh, slide I had. Uh, you know, these are other investment types. Some of them are accessible to individuals. Some of them like private equity and venture capital are more products for institution or hedge funds really are more are more products for more institutional investors. Like the, you know, perhaps the Wayne State Endowment has investments in some of those things. Um, my fund, Brenner West, was a hedge fund. Um, there's obviously uh, lots of other ways to invest. I put real estate on here, uh, gold, uh, Bitcoin, which uh, I'm, I'm by no means uh, an expert or an evangelist for. Um, but uh, I'm happy to go into any or all of this stuff. Um, Sokol, uh, do we want to do some questions? Uh, do you want me to expand on some of this? I'm happy to do whatever. Let's, we, we do, yeah, we do have a few questions that have come directly to me as well as uh, listed in the chat. So I'll go over them now, Josh, um, yeah. in the order. And then I, I, I think that uh, telling people a bit a bit about gold and the gold standard okay. might be an important concept. And of course, a bit more about Bitcoin. That's another one that tends to uh, prick ears up, if I may use that, term, that sort of analogy. So um, one question uh, came in a direct message. Uh, what would be a good tool for beginners to consider while making decisions uh, while investing? Um. Well, look, I think um, for me, uh, you know, by tool, um, so I think the thing that you want to do really is to just, just, just make it as simple as possible. And I, I tried to kind of go over that in some of my, um, uh, in some of this stuff uh, in the first few slides, but, you know, to me, uh, you want to, you want to really, you want to really figure out, you know, what is a reasonable amount of earnings or cash flow that a company is currently throwing off? And how does that compare to the market cap? Those are really the most critical components. And then to really just make sure that a company doesn't have too much debt. Um, the way I do that is really to look at, at filings. You know, all public companies have to file their financial reports on a, uh, a system called EDGAR. 
Um, sometimes you can get this information on Yahoo Finance as well, though I don't trust it to be especially clean. Um, but I think that if you can keep it simple, you know, keep it to a PE and make sure that, they, that, that companies don't have too much debt, um, you know, that's important. I'm happy to define the way I think about cash flow, but the, I don't want to get too technical about stuff. Um, I use a Bloomberg machine, which, which sometimes, uh, which can kind of help you uh, find some of these things quite easily, but not everybody would have access to that. So, you know, something like Yahoo Finance, going to the actual filings on Edgar, um, you know, if you can find a, you know, if Wayne State's endowment has a Bloomberg that people can use, you, you might be able to help with that. But, but again, I, I think just getting it to its most simple uh, conceptual framework where you're saying, this is what I'm paying. This is what I'm getting in terms of earnings. This is, you know, whether this, I think it's going to grow or not grow and, and just make sure it doesn't have too much debt. I think if you start there, you know, it's, it's probably not the worst thing in the world. Thanks, Josh. Um, could you uh, give a bit more specifics on the uh, difference between the companies at uh, S&P 500 and the Dow? Are they fundamentally different businesses um, or are the differences usually negligible? I know that you got into the uh, uh, Dow Jones uh, a little bit, but perhaps you can expand on that. Sure. So the S&P 500, uh, nobody's, nobody's really making any, um, nobody's choosing those companies, but for the fact that they are just simply the biggest 500 companies by market cap in the U.S. And, you know, the people who, uh, S&P itself and the people that manage the index funds that approximate it, are just continually making sure it's the biggest 500 companies. So, uh, you know, it would be all of the kind of Walmarts and Googles and Microsofts and all those sorts of companies. Uh, the Dow Jones, uh, as its name suggests, industrial average was typically uh, meant to be more industrial type companies. So you'd have, you know, more of your, your manufacturing companies as sort of 3Ms of the world, but it also, I believe, includes, it's only 30 companies as opposed to the S&P 500. I think it also includes Walmart and lots of companies like that that sort of touch on the um, industrial economy in one way or another. So as a follow-up quickly for my interest and perhaps others yeah. as well, um, how often are these lists refreshed? Annual basis, quarterly? Um, how often do the, uh, does the assessment occur to include a company in the 500 or in the Dow? So um, they're all different. And I don't know off the top of my head exactly, but um, I believe it's more like quarterly would be my guess. Okay. Um, you know, again, Dow Jones is specifically picking according to their, uh, their sort of proprietary criteria. Uh, S&P is more just a technical thing that, you know, as some, I think every once in a while, they just make sure that they, you know, if, if some company like Enron uh, has gone from huge to zero, that, that it's it's not in the S&P anymore, just by virtue of its size. Uh, actually, it was probably in the Dow in its heyday as well. Um, so I don't know the specific answer, but uh, they are, they're refreshed periodically. It wouldn't be like a daily thing. Okay, so Let's talk about put options because there is a yeah. question about that. Okay. And it states, what do you think of selling secured cash uh, put options if you want to buy 100 shares of a company you are interested in buying anyways? So um, this is a, a very advanced question. Um, <laughs> look, I... I, uh, hey, I had a hard time reading it. So yes, it must be I don't a love selling question. put options because again, if, if you're... If you, uh, if you end up being wrong, there's some leverage to the downside there. Um, you know, it's, uh, I think sometimes people think, well, it's a $50 stock and I like it. It can't go below 40. So I'll just sell put option at, uh, you know, some very low price and it'll never go below that. But, you know, it, it sort of sets you up to be very exposed, you know, in a very bad worst case scenario. And the other thing I don't like about it, to be perfectly honest, is, um, you know, Usually there are very high implied fee implied fees in doing options trades, especially for an individual that it's it's very hard to see a real uh, tight market. And so whatever broker you're using is probably charging you more than you think. And it's an implied fee. It's not something that they're probably gonna tell you explicitly. So my advice is keep it simple, uh, be less levered. And if you like a company, 
uh, you know, make sure you've done your work and, and just buy the stock directly. Um, that, that, that's really more a tool for professionals um, and, and one that frankly professionals misuse all the time anyways. Thank you. Um, questions are piling up, so I'm gonna try and go <laughs> through this, which is great, this is what we wanted. Okay. Uh, what happens if an individual or company cannot pay a short? Um, so uh, again, uh, the mechanics of shorting are such that the company that you're shorting doesn't have any obligation to you. Uh, what happens is um, uh, you have to borrow your shares from a broker. Um, and so they lend you those shares. And if the stock starts going up a lot, one of the dangers of shorting is that that people are gonna wanna sell and make money on their shares that they own. Um, and the broker may have to come to you and say, hey, hey, Josh, we need those shares back that you borrowed from us. And you might get that call at the worst possible time. Um, and uh, it's, being, it's called getting bought in. And so they're saying, hey, uh, you might wanna hold those shares because you've sold them in the market, but we want them back right now. Um, one, of the, one of the key things about buying stocks, selling stocks, shorting that I think sometimes people don't actually understand is that it doesn't affect the company at all. When you buy a share of Walmart, that doesn't do anything for Walmart. Uh, you know, they, sh they sh sold their shares to the public, maybe in a public offering, in an initial public offering called an IPO or a secondary. But your buying and selling doesn't have any effect on their cash flow. You're just buying a share from somebody else who owns it or you're selling it to someone. Uh, but those are third, you're all third parties. So Walmart doesn't care, Microsoft doesn't care, McDonald's doesn't care if you're buying or selling their shares other than uh, the CEOs usually get paid better if the stock prices go up. So they probably rather you buy than sell, but they don't actually, um, nothing actually happens for their cash flow or their obligations when you buy or sell, or, or sell a share. Thanks for that. But I really wasn't referring to uh, individual companies um, or I wasn't referring to the shorted company. I was re referring to a company that shorted said company or oh. not necessarily a company. Maybe that would be more appropriate to say a hedge fund or a mutual fund, index fund, individual. Uh, I see. And, and so your question, so, so your question is what exactly about, about the hedge fund? What, what happens to them if they can't meet debt obligations? Do they go into bankruptcy? Do they have government backup? Does something else happen? So you're not saying in terms of shorting, you're just saying in general, if a hedge fund can't meet their obligations. Exactly. I see, I see. Well, yeah, I mean, look, there's been, uh, there's been many cases of hedge funds and, and other kinds of funds uh, blowing up all the time. Um, they would go into bankruptcy. Uh, it would be like any other private company who can't meet its obligations. Um, you know, typically what happens is that that, will, that that typically occurs when a hedge fund borrows too much money. Um, you know, there's a very famous example uh, from the late 90s. It was a firm of, uh, actually it was, uh, uh, it was, it had like a hundred PhDs, mostly from Ivy League schools, who were trading stocks uh, mostly based on quantitative factors, and uh, they were levered—I don't know, twenty to one or whatever it was—and uh, they got a couple things wrong, and um, uh, you know, it, it created a situation where there were a lot of other people in those same kinds of trade, and it created a uh, you know some systemic risk uh, that that uh, you know was not ideal, but. You know, for the hedge fund itself, uh, you know, they would typically just go, you know, they would go bankrupt like any other company. Excellent. And uh, yeah, thank you, James, for asking that directly. Yeah. Okay. So um, somebody's asking if you wouldn't mind defining again um, the um, and giving us a purpose of a hedge fund. Sure, sure. So, absolutely. So, um, the term hedge fund, in all fairness, it doesn't have a specific definition. And th this is a bit of a cynical view on the industry. Um, but really, what a hedge fund is, the way a hedge fund is differentiated from, say, a mutual fund is that uh, typically a hedge fund can do more. Um, it has a broader mandate. So um, in our case, you know, we could really buy whatever public securities we wanted. We could buy preferreds or pieces of distressed debt. Um, a lot of hedge funds can actually do private stuff. Uh, they can short, they can buy options, um, they can use leverage. 
Um, and typically, so typically it's meant that they have a broad array of what they can do. They typically charge both a management fee and a, a share of the profits. The classic hedge fund structure was like a 1% management fee. So 1% of annual assets and 20% of the profits. And I would say that's declined a little over time. Um, and then the other thing about hedge funds is that they are supposed to be uh, marketed only to accredited individuals or institutions. So you're supposed to have a net worth of, I think it's a few million dollars to invest in a hedge fund directly. Um, but that's really the difference between a hedge fund and a mutual fund. And within hedge funds, I mean, there's just so many different kinds. There are, you know, there are ones that are truly hedged, which typically means that they're not exposed to the market. There's ones that are less hedged. There's ones that do debt. There's ones that do equity. There's ones that buy mortgage securities. You know, there's a very, very wide array of what's meant by that concept. But um, the fee structure and the uh, opportunistic nature of it is typically what differentiates it, as long as, as well as the um, investor requirements. Thanks, Josh. Um, next question, and you've touched on this already, but perhaps uh, expand a bit more if you don't mind. What resources do you use to find companies that you may want to buy shares in? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, I will go directly into the Edgar filings, which are the public filings that public companies have to file with the SEC. Edgar is E-D-G-A-R, if anyone um, uh, you know, wants to Google it and look at those directly. And, you know, from there, I can get to their uh, annual reports, quarterly reports. Those will have all the financial statements. Um, if you go to a company's website, they will typically have an investor presentation that lays out, hopefully, um, you know, what the company does and, you know, what, have, what are our current trends and what are opportunities and what are things to look out for. And um, typically on the website, they'll have a link to their quarterly investor calls you can listen to. Um, you know, I use Bloomberg uh, as a way to screen for new investments um, and to run screens uh, in other ways, um, to see who else owns the company, um, to look for all the kinds of different factors that, that I would want to look in. Um, I'm a member of something called valueinvestorsclub.com, which I think is fantastic. Uh, which anybody can go on and take a look at, though I think unless you're a member, it's like three or four months dated, but it was founded by some really smart value investors here uh, in New York. Um, I actually know one of the co-founders of it, and uh, I've been a member of it for like 17 or 18 years. Uh, my wife calls it the, the nerd investing website, so I'm always on there. Um, so those are the main tools that, that, that I use. I mean, there are other other people use something called fact set, uh, but you need to have a subscription to that. And I, I don't have one. I think that's, uh, it's kind of people, you kind of either use that or Bloomberg. Um, so there, there's lots of different ways, but um, I, I get wary of, of using stuff that's too uh, kind of uh, prepared. You know, some of the Yahoo Finance stuff, like I wouldn't take their word for what a PE ratio is. I would want to go in and look at the financial reports myself and, um, you know, make sure that it was, it was a sort of clean ratio I was looking at. Thanks, Josh. And I, I did put the link to um, Edgar from the SEC in the chat box. So if anybody's interested, they can just um, hunt it or get it from there. It was a very easy Google search, you're right. <laughs> um, I'm gonna merge two questions here together. Any recommendations on choosing a broker? Would you recommend something like Acorns or Robinhood or a similar app um, for a beginning investor? So I think I'm just going to say, I don't know. I've never used either of those. Um, you know, I know that Robinhood has become something of a phenomenon. Um, you know, I, I would be personally wary of some of the stocks that people are bidding up a lot via Robinhood, the GameStops and AMCs of the world. Um, one other oddity about the markets today is that a lot of the online brokers actually have no commission features. Um, but the, the irony of it is they actually charge you more for your trades than they did when they charged you commissions. And the reason is that um, they don't take a commission, but uh, when they go to fill your order, uh, they don't necessarily, uh, they're not legally obligated in all cases to get you the very best price that is absolutely out there. And um, I use interactive brokers among other, other things. I think interactive brokers is really good. And I actually chose to pay 
commissions because that got me the better pricing when I went to actually buy and sell things. Um, I don't, I, I'm not an expert enough to know the specific differences between Robinhood and Robinhood stuff. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody wants to know more about uh, stock buybacks. Um, yeah. And she says, I heard that a company can essentially artificially inflate their value before the end of the quarter through these buybacks. Is evaluation still credible in these instances? So um, this is an interesting topic uh, that I, I think uh, a lot of people don't understand. Um, uh, so uh, I, I'll, 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 uh, I'll acknowledge that, that I'm definitely a Democrat, um, but I think a lot of the Democratic politicians have, uh, have taken this issue and twisted it a little bit. So uh, what a stock buyback is, is very simple. Um, it's really just a, uh, it's buying shares uh, and retiring them, spending the shareholders' money to retire shares. And at a conceptual level, there's nothing wrong with that. So um, forget public companies, but you know, if if uh, if Sokol and I, uh, if if Sokol, uh, me and James, because he's the first name I see on there, if the three of us had a company, and uh, you know, Sokol and I thought it was worth twenty dollars, and uh, James is willing to sell us his shares for ten. Um, Sokol and I would be super excited to buy those shares from him, right? And then, uh, then there would only be, uh, there'd be a third less shares outstanding. So Sokol and I would go from owning uh, a third of the business to 50% each, and we'd be able to buy his shares for less than they're worth. And I think when a stock buyback is done well, it can really create value for the shareholders that are left. Um, I personally think a company should only buy back shares if they have a very strong reason to believe that they're trading for less than they're worth. To me, that's the key thing. Um, I do think that buybacks can be abused by corporate management. So I, 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 I think it's a good question. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, and this drives me absolutely crazy, companies will say, well, we just buy back stock to offset dilution or you know the amount that we're paying ourselves in in stock options and to me that's crazy because you're paying yourself that in stock options you shouldn't be taking the shareholder money and offsetting what you're paying yourself like that doesn't that doesn't make any sense and and I do think uh, to the question there are times where companies aren't trying to do a buyback which is good for everyone like the so-called James and Josh example but you know they're really just trying to get their stock up in the short term and and that can be a bad thing so um, I don't think they typically do it. I, th I, I actually don't think companies are allowed to buy shares typically right before the end of the quarter because they can only do it during when they're, there's something called blackout periods where um, you know, they can only buy it uh, during certain times uh, when they don't have information that would be considered inside information or where it's not too close to the end of a quarter. So I don't think it's really an issue around quarters, but I do think that there are some bad management teams that use stock buybacks like in a somewhat somewhat manipulative way. So I think there are also good uh, management teams that use it in a highly productive way. Um, so I'm kind of uh, of a mixed mind on stock buybacks. Thank you. And now for a tough question, <laughs> which at least, at least I think it's a tough question, but okay. I, I think it's a very reasonable question for somebody sure. who's done, uh, hasn't done this before. So for someone who has never invested in the stock market, what do you think might be a reasonable amount to invest at the start and what sort of investment would be a safer, perhaps medium risk? So I'll answer the second part first. Uh, the second part as I, as uh, hopefully I, I, I said clearly in the presentation is, I think the best thing to buy is the S&P 500, is an index fund that represents the S&P 500 because it's low fee, it's diversified, it's highly liquid, you're not gonna lose all your money, so if it were up to me, if, if my sister or my cousin says, I have some savings, I wanna, you know, I don't want, I want, I want, I want it in the equity market. So I wanna try to grow it over time. That's what I would tell them. I would say, just buy the S&P 500. Don't, don't go crazy making big bets on individual companies uh, until you've done a lot of work and, and had some training or, or whatever. Um, you know, look, as to the amount that you should put in, um, uh, I'll refer back to the Berkshire Hathaway guys. Uh, you know, I think it should be an amount where if it goes down 40 or 50%, even if it's the S&P 500, I mean, there have been times, uh, you know, 2008 was one of them. 
you know, uh, 2000, uh, I can't remember what year it was, 2020 with COVID was another one where the market can be down 40%. And if you had individual stocks, you might have been down 80% uh, or down less than 40%. But, you know, I think you should, you should invest in an amount where uh, you can afford to leave it in for a long time. And if it goes down 40% uh, at any one time, uh, you can be in a position to add more or at least a position where you haven't compromised your, your savings. All right, thank you. Uh, that was great. We're gonna move now a bit away from that and talk potentially a bit about the international indexed funds. So do you recommend buying international index funds? If yes, what might be a good ratio of S&P compared to international uh, index fund? Yeah, so um, one thing about the S&P is that uh, you actually get a lot of international exposure through that. I mean, if you think about companies like, um, you know, Microsoft or uh, you know, even the Walmarts of the world, you know, they all have big businesses outside the US. So um, you're getting international exposure. Uh, you know, look, I think uh, before this year, I might have said that uh, it's good to have some exposure to some of the faster growing economies. Um, I might have said China, you know, the what's gone on there this year in terms of uh, you know, some of the political changes make me a little more fearful of investing uh, in China. Um, I don't think you're gonna, uh, you know, Europe has frankly, Europe and Japan have, have really lagged the US over the last few decades, uh, Japan especially, but Europe as well. And so you would have done better just being in the US, but I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, being diversified. You know, own, they're owning a, a little bit of emerging markets, a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, EMEA, which is uh, you know, uh, some of the Europe and, uh, and East Asia stuff. Um, I don't have a specific ratio in mind, but uh, I do think that if you just do the S and P five hundred, that's that's fine. Um, but uh, I think you know, if if you if you uh, if you want to be even more diversified than that, there's there's nothing wrong with having some different exposures. And you know, if it were me, I'd probably do less Europe and, and more Asia, more emerging markets, but I would think of those as more volatile and, and more risky. Thank you. And so maybe in a way a follow-up, but perhaps not. Anyway, next question, yeah. I suppose I should say, do yeah. you recommend passive or active investment? So when I say the S&P 500, that is a passive investment. Um, you know, I, I had this little uh, slide on here about, uh, yeah, the, about mutual funds. So mutual funds are active investments. That's where a professional manager would assemble a group of stocks for you. Um, and, you know, again, 85% of those mutual funds lag the S&P 500 from the 10 years ending 2019. Now, uh, I was always very proud. My partner and I, uh, we beat the S&P 500 over 14 years by a fairly significant margin without using a lot of leverage. So I was always arguing the other side of this, but, you know, when I'm, when I'm, uh, you know, advising people who uh, you know maybe are are in are in this position, I, I always say passive because it's cheaper, it's more liquid, it's more diversified, and uh, you know you, you probably have a lower chance of losing a lot of your money and Thank a good you. chance of growing over time. Exactly. All right, Josh, time to tell us a bit about the gold standard. <laughs> well, I'm not an economist, so I, I don't have. Um, <laughs> I don't have a, I don't have a especially academic view of the gold standard. I mean, look, I own a little bit of gold. Typically, uh, th this isn't the gold standard, but in, people that typically want to own gold are, are people who, uh, you know, are very worried about inflation. And so, um, and, and you can own real estate, you can own commodities. I own some of all those things. Um, you know, I think uh, the U.S. is printing a lot of money. There's a lot of new currency. We're borrowing a lot of money. And I think it's reasonable to think that over time that might make individual dollars less valuable. Uh, we'll see. Um, people have turned to gold and things like Bitcoin or real estate um, as things that you know uh, will be able to hold their value in a world where dollars are less. Um, you know, I think it's reasonable to own a little bit of those things as a hedge on, on inflation. Um, you know, I think the, uh, again, I'm not an academic, but uh, the U.S. went off the gold standard, uh, I don't know, in the 30s or 40s, I want to say. And um, I don't, 
I, I've never seen any serious academic literature that thinks that the U.S. should really go back to the gold standard. Um, you could make arguments that maybe we should print less money, um, though I think there's good arguments on the other side of that as well. That the you know the you know a lot of the money that we're printing to help sustain the economy and to fund programs is uh, does a lot of good. And so far, at least up until this year, we haven't seen a lot of inflation. There there does seem like there's a lot more in the in the system now, um, partially as a function of um, <coughs> what's happened to supply chains during COVID. But yeah, I mean, look, I think, I think uh, owning a little bit of gold uh, is, is, uh, is a reasonable thing to do. You know, the, the downside with gold, the downside with Bitcoin is that they're fundamentally unproductive assets. They don't, uh, uh, they don't grow. Um, they don't produce any dividends. Uh, you know, they are just a store of value. So, you know, over time, the price of gold hasn't really gone up much relative to dollars. Um, and so you haven't lost any money, um, but you would have done much better just investing in really good companies or hopefully in, in a diversified index of really good companies. That's great. Thank you. Um, I want to take a moment and remind everybody who is here, and I know that some of you have been texting me that you need to leave soon because of class beginning uh, in just a few minutes. So um, I want to remind you all that you will be uh, receiving a short survey uh, later on about this session and we would love your feedback so that we could keep improving uh, this session as well as all the others that are coming um, later on. Um, a last question that I have in my list from the information I've been getting, Josh, is how um, should we interpret institutional ownership, public ownership, et cetera, of a company when studying companies and their valuation? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think it's really hard. I personally don't spend a lot of time trying to think about who the other owners are. Um, you know, I, I trust my own analysis and judgments. I, I focus on the company. I focus on the cash flow it produces. I, I make sure it doesn't have too much debt. I'm not especially worried about who the other owners are, especially if I'm, if I'm going to own it for multiple years, because uh, you know, other people buy and sell for their own reasons. They don't, they don't tell you what those are necessarily, and you may or may not care if they did. So, um, you know, most big companies, uh, companies in the S&P 500 have very diversified institutional ownership uh, uh, groups. And so um, it's not a factor that I, I think is very easy to incorporate into your decision making. All right. Thank you. Nick um, has a follow-up on about owning gold. What does it mean to okay. quote unquote own gold? Does it mean that I own physical gold or do I just own quote unquote shares of gold? So this is a good question. Um, I think the easiest way to do it if you want to is to, there are actually are index funds um, that track the price of gold. I think it's, if you type, if you type in GLD, that's an index of gold prices. Um, if you type in GDX, that's actually an index of gold companies. I would do it with the price, not the companies, because that's a whole nother layer of analysis. Um, you know, there are some crazy conspiracy theorists in my industry who've gotten like physical gold delivered to some safe. Um, I don't think that's very practical. And, you know, if the world is really coming to an end, like those people are worried about, I don't think it's really going to save them. Um, so I, I think the best way to do it is with a is like with one of those indexes. I, I own a little bit of GLD. I think that's that's probably the the sanest way to go about that. Yeah, and I did find it uh, on finance uh, yahoo .com, um, SPDR gold shares GLD. So yeah, exactly. that's that's very interesting. Um, well, I. Any other questions for Josh uh, while we have him here? And again, I know that um, you are starting to log off because of the pending classes at 4 p.m. All right, otherwise, Josh, thank you so much for being with us. Um, this has been absolutely great. And um, I'm sure that we'll have lots of follow-up questions um, that I'll probably send your way and get some okay. responses in the future. And um, maybe you I mean, maybe we can get you back for a follow-up to this in the near future. Sure. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Thanks. Uh, thanks to everybody. Have a lovely afternoon. Be safe out there. And uh, we shall see you next week.